Hello and welcome back to HIV.gov's coverage of the conference on retroviruses and opportunistic infections, also known as CROI. Again, I am Lewis Shackelford, he, him pronouns. I am the Director of External Relations at the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, and I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Laron Nelson of Yale University. It's great to see you, Laron. Hey, good to see you too, Lewis. Yes. So you are such a staunch advocate of community involvement and in research. You have done such work, such great work around community involved research and advocating for community involvement in research. Can you break down for our audience, what is the significance of community having meaningful impact in the research space? Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, to me, the implication is that we, we're gonna be, if we don't have community voices or we'll engaged communities, that we're gonna be asking the wrong questions. We're not asking the best questions we could be asking. We're not designing the studies in the best way that's gonna produce the outcome that we need and might end up with answers that aren't as relevant as they could be. And so I, I think it's important to involve communities, not just because they're the ones who may be sort of the recipient of whatever the end product is of the research, but they have a lived experience that we need. And every time we think about the research that we want to design, and that has to be a part of it. I'll, I'll say even uh, the last few days, there's been this talk about what is community science? And mm -hmm. we talk about these different types of sciences, but what is the science of community or just the science or the expertise of folk with lived experience and figuring out ways that we incorporate that into the other types of science that we sort of prioritize here at CROI. So, I'm looking forward to hearing more of that at this meeting, uh, and hopefully more studies are present on that in the future core meetings that we have. That sounds amazing. And so for those who don't know, what does it look like when community is meaningfully involved in research? I mean, I think you end up with, I don't know how to say it, like studies that work well and products that are relevant. I talked yesterday, I talked about the ring uh, the, the vaginal prep ring. And it's like this perfect example of what we can end up with if we do things that align with what communities wanted and that communities have input. And I remember during that time, all the input that came from the community. And I remember having a sense, not that they were going to listen to it and say, well, we can't do it or we can't do it this way or that way. But they, those investigators are really trying to figure out how do we do what they asked us to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. And I think that's unusual. I think it, it is becoming more common, maybe more common this year, hopefully even more frequent in future years. But to me, if we have community engagement, what it looks like is we end up with studies that aren't difficult to recruit for, right? Because people are doing things because they know it's what they want in the community. And then we end up with sort of products or technologies that make sense for the way people live their lives. Right. And so I'm hearing that community is not just rubber stamping a study or the scientists aren't coming up with ideas and just saying community sign off on right. this, but community actually being involved from the very beginning yeah. of the research process, when the study is being conceived to all the way through to promotion of the results yeah. and things like that. And we have to, be, I think a, a key part of what you said is this rubber stamp business, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that, uh, you have to believe, we have to believe that the community has something valuable to contribute to it. And so, and then being open to revising our plan if somebody's giving us different information. And I think that is, I wanna believe that that is becoming more uh, appreciated in the scientific community to do that. And I can think of examples, like I mentioned, the vaginal ring is a really good example of folks who've done that. And we're trying to do it in the studies even that I'm leading. But I do think that, that uh, uh, it requires a willingness to change direction mm. or to rethink your plan, but to end up doing something in a way that really respects community uh, and makes the science better. I love that. I love that. And so you mentioned the vaginal ring. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, of all the things that you've been hearing at CROI, are there any other HIV prevention studies or prevention mm -hmm. tools that you've really gotten excited about? Well... I'm excited about this dual prevention method that I've been hearing about, you know, this product that can, I think it's PrEP and contraception together. Mm -hmm. To me, that sounds fascinating. I know 
several colleagues I've bumped into around have talked about the pill burden on women, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, and sort of the promise of this uh, dual uh, method. Uh, so I'm interested in that. Clearly, I'm interested in understanding how long-acting injectable for PrEP is sort of panning out around the world. And there's a lot, there's a lot of folks who are presenting strategies that they've used to try to increase equitable use of long act, acting injectables. So mm -hmm. I want to see more about that. Uh, there was one presentation today, which was about this uh, long acting oral agent. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, uh, it was just safety and tolerability data. And I think tomorrow there's a poster session that'll talk more about it. But I mean, that's something on the horizon. We'll see how it pans out. But those are things that I'm really, really curious about uh, hearing more at Croy. And real quick, you use the term tolerability. What does yeah. that mean for people who don't know? It's, let me think of a way to say it. One is safety, is, is it gonna hurt you? And one is, uh, is it gonna bother you so much that you really can't deal with it? Mm. And so uh, uh, it could be ways that you feel, you know, something that you might feel, or ways that you can't feel, but it might be disrupting your body. And so mm. when they first start testing these drugs, they wanna know, is it gonna hurt somebody? Mm -hmm. Gonna kill you or make you really, really sick? And can a human being deal with the effects of this drug in their body, either either in how they feel or what these sort of uh, tests that they might run your body to tell you how the organs are functioning? So that's what they presented today, and Got they look good. Uh, but you know, this still has have more work to do. But uh, hopefully, <laughs> they'll engage. They'll be engaging communities in those processes yeah. as they move that forward. Yeah. I hope so. Lots of opportunity for that here, I think. So. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention you have your own study that is you're getting off the ground for right now. So do you want to say more to our audience about that study? I can. Yeah. So this is a study. Uh, it's called HIV Prevention Trials Network 096, but we abbreviate it as HPTN. Uh, that's happening in five communities across the country, you know, Atlanta, Dallas, Montgomery, Alabama, Memphis, in the and, in, and in southern yeah, Southern Florida, but all up from the east to the west, all across the south. Nice. And, you know, I'm glad you asked me that because what we're really trying to do is figure out how we really take what community has told us. If you want us, if you want PrEP to work the way you say it's going to work, whether it's the oral version or injectable version, there's a lot of other stuff out there that we have to deal with. And so you have to figure out ways to deal with that thing so that we can take make the most of this PrEP agent. And some of it is things we haven't tried before. I mean, I'm doing this in HBTN, and some of these strategies are new. Mm -hmm. But we said, this is what the community told us. And so we got to figure out a way to do it. And I'm fortunate because it is very uncommon for a study of this type to be underway in the network, even funded by NIH. But we're, we're trying it. We have created a strategy that is completely based on what the communities have told us is necessary. We're trying to figure out ways to do it. And so I'm I'm excited about what that can do to reduce HIV infections among Black men who are sex with men across the South, which is uh, the part of the country where the epidemic is really sort of out of control right now. Awesome. And if somebody wanted to learn more about HPTN 096, how would they do it? Yeah, they could just go to hptn096.org uh, and learn about the study, but uh, it's coming soon. All yeah. right. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it, Dr. Nelson. It is so great to talk to you. You are a real inspiration to me. Um, my career has been in line with you because of your advocacy. I feel like I have a career. And so wow. you just are such an inspiration. I really enjoy talking to you. Thank so, you. I, it's my pleasure to talk to you too. I, I'm, I'm touched by those <laughs> words. Uh, I consider you a peer and a colleague, but, but I am glad uh, that I've done something that uh, you can look up to. So thank you. you. Have, you've done something that we all can look <laughs> up to. And so thank you all for joining us today. Again, we have more coverage from Croy 2024 this year, this uh, week. Please look out for it on HIV.gov, on their blog and social media channels. And thank you again for joining us today. Take care.